Hello and welcome into my first video on the Bruins for the 2019-2020 season. Now, I've been on a little bit of a hiatus. After I made the draft recap video, I just didn't feel like talking hockey this summer. I had the time. I just didn't feel like it. After the way the Bruins uh, went out in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals, still hard to talk about. Like, obviously I can talk about it, but like, I don't really want to acknowledge it. I just didn't feel like talking hockey this summer. So I waited, I waited. I moved into a dorm at the University of Maine where I go to school, and uh, it, it's a little bit of an adjustment, of course, so I haven't had the time to make a video, but I want to make videos throughout this whole year, and this video is going to recap a little bit of the off-season and my thoughts on it. Not a lot, though, because you guys already know everything about that. I'm going to go over all eight games. I have detailed notes on all of them. I'm going to go over some stats. I'm going to go over a lot of stuff, and uh, my plan for the videos is going forward. I'm not going to do eight. That's way too many games to do in one video. This video might be a little longer because of that. My plan is to do four or five. I'm not going to keep myself to a strict limit because uh, I need to keep my schedule flexible for classes and all that. And obviously I have a roommate as well who like I don't want to annoy asking him to leave the room. So you guys got to keep that in mind when you're looking for my uploads. But they will come and I will talk about every game this season. Uh, I'm a journalism major. I want to cover pro hockey one day, so I really care about the subject, so I hope you enjoy my coverage on it. So uh, let's get into talking about the Bruins. Now, I want to talk about tonight and injuries and all that. So tonight, the Bruins play the Leafs. The Bruins just lost the Leafs Saturday night in overtime to the Maple Leafs. I don't really weigh overtime losses really heavily against teams because it's not the same format that you use in playoffs. But at the same time, it's a drop point. But it's on the road in Toronto, so I don't really hate the result. A lot of the results the Bruins have, I've either liked a lot or I haven't hated. They haven't really had a bad loss this season yet. Uh, now, I know the Colorado one might have not won a lot of people's way that they wanted to because of the goals that were called back. But it's the NHL. That's the way it is. It's going to happen. But um, the things I want to talk about tonight... Uh, specifically Anders Bjork. I have his pitcher down here in the left, and he got called up a little bit earlier than I would have liked to see. Now, Anders Bjork has been tearing up the AHL since he's been down there. Eight points in seven games, and he looks like a very good prospect who should be a pretty good pro once his two-way game kicks in because he has the offensive talent. I saw him play live when he went to Notre Dame. They came around when they were in Hockey East because for some reason, Notre Dame was in Hockey East, and now they're not, which is for the best for their travel and just, like, in general, like, it makes sense. Notre Dame should be in the Big Ten facing Ohio State, Michigan. Just geographically, that makes way more sense. But uh, I was lucky enough to see Anders Bjork, and he was phenomenal. I remember one game he torched UMass Lowell, but uh, that's neither here nor there. We're in the future now, and uh, or <laughs> not in the future, but we're in the present now. That's in the past, and he has eight points in seven games. He's played with the Bruins before. And uh, let me see. Can I get stats here? NHL stats. He's played 50 games and has 15 points. So this isn't his first go around. But he's a more mature player. He's had some issues with shoulder surgeries and all that. But uh, I'm really curious to see how he's going to look. But the thing I don't really like tonight are the lines. Now, the first line is going to always be together. Uh, if you OG and you remember my older videos, I've wanted that line uh, taken apart for a while. I kind of gone off that fence because I'm not sure I trust other units to produce. I, I've kind of bounced back with the thought that maybe Marshawn should be split up from Bergeron, but at the same time, if you're winning with the formula you have, leave the first line together and try to figure out the depth. The issue is uh, depth pieces that we've acquired in the past, like Rick Nash and Marcus Johansson, have been pure rentals, and we always go through this every year, it seems like, or the last few years, where we just deal with crap depth and then we make a trade later in the season. Whereas uh, we're really tight with the cap too. So it's really going to be hard to get in a depth player. Uh, players are going to have to be moved if we don't get the depth scoring from inside like inside of our system. Uh, because a lot of younger players haven't come up and made an impact. And hopefully Bjork is where that changes. Because uh, really, uh, Coil is the only real acquisition we've made outside of our franchise that has stayed forward-wise in a while and he's very good and he really bolsters the lineup but we still have that gaping hole and you guys all know it is the second line right wing spot 
and it's really just blasphemous that we're slotting in Brett Ritchie there with a fully health. No one's injured. No one's injured. You just got Brett Ritchie on the second line. Nothing against Brett Ritchie. He's actually been decent for us. Uh, I'm not really sure he has a spot where he naturally fits, though, because the Bruins seem to love having these usable fourth liners. But the thing is, we have a lot of fourth liners. Uh, but uh, the second line tonight against Toronto is DeBrus, Coyle, and Ritchie which isn't a terrible line. Obviously, Krejci's injured. I'll talk about injuries in a second. But uh, I'm not really digging uh, Richie on that line. I, the, the real reason I hate this is because Danton Heinen is on the fourth line when Danton Heinen has been outside of the top line, probably a top three forward outside of the first line. He's He's been very good for us this year. He's been an offensive source in a depth pool that really has no offense. Uh, you, you've been looking for guys like Jake DeBrus to step up. Luckily, he got his first goal the other day against Toronto. But uh, a lot left to be desired to have Jake DeBrus, who you're hoping, uh, what's Jake DeBrus, 22, 23, something like that? He's young. And you would hope he has taken a step forward. And obviously, it's a long season, so I'm not making any uh, judgments on Jake DeBrus' progression yet. But, uh, yeah, he's 23, and he has two points in eight games. He had 42 and 68, so he's... Uh, underperforming his points per game so far but early season and i really think i said this i tweeted it follow me at twitter at bruins fan 638837 the first line's numbers uh you get all my opinions i really highly recommend following me self-endorsement but uh i said once jake debrus gets his first goal expect his production to go up so obviously he got the first goal i expect the monkey off the back I think he's going to get some more, uh, hopefully tonight. He loves scoring against Toronto. He might just get another one tonight. Uh, but uh, Heinen should definitely be up on the second line, as I said. Bjork on the third line with Corrali and Wagner. I don't hate that second line. I meant third line. I would prefer Bjork, Corrali, and Richie, to be honest, on the third line with Wagner moving down to the fourth with uh who that fourth line looks rough to be honest with uh if you had Wagner, Lindholm and Backus, but it looks rough with Heinen, Lindholm and Backus. Uh that line I hopefully won't get more than eight minutes tonight, but I don't really like those lines. Uh but the defense is what it usually is. Chara McAvoy, Krug Carlo, Clifton Grizzly. Obviously we have those two injuries on the blue line, which I'll talk uh Rask is starting tonight by the way. But uh I'll talk about the uh the injuries right now. So defense right now and this is really a tricky subject to talk about because it might not matter who the best player at the position is for cap reasons. And you might be saying, what do you mean? Well, right now the Bruins have eight defensemen who can play at an NHL level night to night. And what I mean by that is all six of the guys I said who are in tonight, obviously the top four is one of the best top fours in the league. And then you have Clifton and Grizzly who form a very dynamic third pairing that you can trust uh miller and john moore though are also nhl players who should start in the league every night when healthy ne neither of them are healthy right now though and then you have camper which camper is a nice seventh defenseman camper isn't going to go anywhere he's probably just going to remain with the bruins for a bit now but uh the thing with miller and moore is even when they're healthy their cap hits are a lot more than grizzlicks and Clifton's and uh, let me just check Grizzlick because Grizzlick I know is being paid more now. Grizzlick makes 1.4. Clifton's on uh, 725,000 this year and then a million across for uh, three more years. So Clifton is on a great deal. So Clifton's not going to go anywhere. And then when uh, he's a right defenseman, when Miller becomes healthy, Miller, Kevin Miller is a 2.5 million cap hit which is counting against the uh, cap right now. But uh, John Moore is a left defenseman whose 2.75 million is not being counted against the cap hit right now because he's on long-term injured reserve. And once he comes back, we're over the cap by a decent amount. So one of them is going to have to go, maybe both of them. And you can probably get some back for both of them because they both should start. Obviously, health concerns. Miller's 28. He signed on a nice deal under three million for four more years. So if you're gonna trade Miller, that that you're gonna get something decent back. Not nothing like too special, but you might get like a third round pick, uh, maybe a prospect who's uh, not extremely highly talented but can like fill a third line spot one day. But uh, 
Miller, on the other hand, is also going to get you something. Probably not as much as more because of age and uh, a little more health concern. But Miller might be a better player than Clifton when fully healthy. Um, Clifton, more speedy, more versatile. Miller, more of a shutdown defenseman. And a lot of teams would use Kevin Miller and John Moore. And maybe, just maybe, you can find a way to find a team with a lot of cap space who's kind of in the dumps to give Miller and maybe you can just give them Miller and possibly David Backus because David Backus's contract is a lot more movable now with only two years left compared to the last year when it was three and the year before when it was four. Uh, that would be a major cap relief. There's definitely moves to get cap space that can be made by Don Sweeney. It's a matter of if you have the right team in the right spot, you could even like, you could probably even give a prospect and Backus for something just to get David Backus off the books uh, because it would really help us now fill a second line right wing spot because he's being paid like a second line right wing but he's playing fourth line and being scratched and I really feel like there are teams out there who as the season go on will realize we're not going to win this year let's take David Backus for two years we'll eat his contract for the rest of this year because we're crap next year rebuilding year We'll eat his contract then. Let's get a pick or a prospect from the Bruins who can help us long term. And that is what should happen this year. It's a movable contract. Obviously, he has a no movement clause, uh, but he has a 15 team trade list. He can probably, you can probably find one of those 15 teams that isn't on the trade list to ship him off to. But uh, that's just my piece on that. But uh, let's go into other injuries on uh, forward side. Coolman. Blocked a shot against Toronto the other night. He will not play tonight. Uh, not a lot of info there. I'm assuming not a major injury because they would have released more on that. Nordstrom upper body injury, which is lingering, which is kind of sad because he should be in the lineup. He can fill a third line spot if needed. Obviously, you prefer him on the fourth uh, when the lineup's fully healthy, but he can fill a third line role. He's a very versatile forward, one of our better depth forwards. Hopefully, he gets healthy soon. And then you got the big one, which is a 73 point man last year, a little bit older. As I said, a lot of the Bruins' key pieces are older. David Krejci is one of them. 73-point getter last year, and without him in the lineup, you have a major hole. Moves Coyle up to the second line when Coyle is the perfect third-line center, and maybe, oh, just maybe, he'll be the uh, second-line right wing if we really can't address that because uh, Sean Crowley can play third-line center if need be. But uh, obviously, you don't want that. You want Coyle in the third and you want to acquire a second line right wing, which I sound like a broken record compared to last year because I was just saying a lot of the same things. But uh, those are my thoughts on the current topics. Now I'm going to talk about the games. And uh, game one was against the Stars. Uh, cool little thing, George Bush actually dropped the opening puck. I uh, don't really care about politics, but it is interesting to see a former president drop the opening puck for the Bruins start of the season. Obviously, he's a Stars fan, being uh, Texas and all that. He's from there i'm pretty sure he lives there i know his dad was from uh connecticut or mass or something though but i'm pretty sure he's a texan through and through uh no Krejci tonight he did not start the season lindholm surprisingly would start on the second line center uh lines have changed a little i'm not going to go over the lines for all of these because uh it's just been a rotation minus the first line and the defense has been the same except for campers in for a few games so i'm not going to waste my time going over the lines with you so george bush drops the puck to start the season that just sounds weird to say. And former team, uh, former member of the Stars would get the scoring start off 109 into the first period, which is uh, Brett Ritchie from Charlie Coyle. And I, the Stars announcer, I go through the highlights to, to uh, freshen up on this stuff because when you do eight games, you just need to go through highlights. And uh, when you have the home team is the one they show the highlights for for NHL. So the commentary, the guy went, "Wow, ouch!" That's all he said for commentating this goal by Brett Ritchie. Just like that, scores against his former team. Uh, it was a Cogliano turnover that led to it, and just a shot from the top of the circle, which beats Bishop five hole. Bishop was not expecting the shot there, and luckily this one beat him because Bishop would be tough to beat. But um, tonight, minus the first period, uh, 559 power play, second unit, uh, 559 into the first power play unit. The second power, I'm stumbling, sorry. The second power play unit would get on the board with Dan Heinen sniping. Good puck movement by the second unit. The second unit in the first few games was a lot better than the first unit. Uh, Richie and Coyle screen, which was a big part of this goal. Uh, McAvoy and Grizzlick would get the assist. So it was a full effort by all five of the members on the ice. 
And uh, one thing that I noticed in this first period as well was uh, Rupe Hintz burned Charlie McAvoy. And Rupe Hintz stood out in this game. Uh, he was one of the lone bright spots offensively for the Stars in this game. And uh, he would burn the Bruins later in the game. So uh, Hintz would eventually get on the board in the second period. 7.55 into the second. Assisted by Matthias Yanmark and new star Joe Pavelski. Which is very weird seeing him in a Stars uniform. Uh, Bruins have the puck in the zone. Char goes to change. As he goes to change, Coyle turns it over. Pavelski leads the pass up. And uh, McAvoy gets stranded by himself on a transition breakout uh, between Yanmark and Hintz. Yanmark passes it to Hintz. Hintz just blows by McAvoy with that elite speed and finishes on Rask. Uh, one thing that happened before this, which I should have mentioned, but uh, my notes were a little out of order here. Uh, let me just say, let me just finish up that though. Hintz burned him. Uh, Char, unlucky change to be honest, because we have possession in the zone. That's usually when defensemen go to change. Timely takeaway by Pavelski, and it leads to this goal, which would be the Stars' only goal of the game. But before this happened, Roman Polak got stretched off the ice. He went for a hit on uh, Wagner. He was trying to drive him into the boards. It didn't seem like it was going to be a dirty play by Polak. Obviously, Jack Edwards said something about hockey karma, which uh, led to a little bit of controversy online. Jack Edwards, uh, love him or hate him, a lot of people do. And uh, I kind of whatever on him. But uh, that led to controversy. So I thought I'd bring it up. But uh, Polak hopefully is going to be okay. I actually have not checked his injury report uh to be honest but uh you hate to see a player go down like that but uh anyway you'd have a 2-1 game and both of the goalies would shut the door from this point and uh it seemed like the stars were getting the better of the chances later on in the game but we held out and we got the first win of the season to improve to 1-0 and uh rask had a very good game rask was player of the game in my opinion um uh, as i said through these first few games the first power play unit struggled to get going but obviously that would change uh so then you move on to game two which was against arizona krejci plays his first game of the season he goes into second line and uh, a few other changes in the depth go defense stays the same uh one thing you gotta say about the coyotes game also i forgot to do this i had the star stats there uh, 29 to 20, as I said, seemed like they were getting more shots. We got more power plays. We scored on a power play goal, which you could say was the difference at the end of the game. But uh, I'm going to move on from that one and bring in the Coyotes. You got to have visuals. I don't want you guys just looking at my face forever. Uh, this one is a game that was very forgettable. If there's a game in the 2019-2020 season that you probably shouldn't watch or go back and look at highlights of, it's this one. Pretty boring game. And one thing you got to say, Kessel looks weird in a Coyotes jersey. The Bruins came out and had a really bad first. They were being outshot 11 to three in the first. Halak was playing well. 18:41 in the period, uh, it gets salvaged though. The first period by Brad Marchand, who gets a out of the run of play goal, just a snipe from uh, from the circle. Pasta and Bergeron were in a puck battle down low with uh, two Coyotes. Bergeron wins the puck battle. You know he's kind of a sulky winner here and there. Uh, backhand pass to Marshawn who crept into the faceoff circle and snipes near post on Darcy Kemper. That would be the only goal. Pretty boring game overall, but a good goalie showdown. Both goalies played very well. Darcy Kemper played very well. Uh, Halak played well. And uh, power play unit, as I said up to this point through two games, was one for six with no goals. The Well, the first power play unit had no goals, but the power play in general was one and six because the second unit got a goal. But we're 2-0 despite the lack of offense because of great defense. The Bruins might be one of the best defensive teams in the league. And we move on to game three, which is Las Vegas. Which this game, if you this is the opposite of Coyotes. This was a great game to watch and a very fun one. As you can see, both high shot totals for both teams. And uh, the Bruins would improve to 3-0 in this game as well. And uh, this is the first big test because Vegas was is is a big time team out west and a big time contender uh i'd say they're top three in the western conference uh some depth changes to the fourth line rask versus mark andre Fleury. it doesn't get much better than this for a non-rival game in my opinion a good start but a goaltender interference call on brett ritchie 636 on the power play cody glass rookie for the vegas golden knights Picks Charlie McAvoy's pocket pass to Pacioretty in front. Quick pass lateral to Stone. Barely beats Rask glove side, but Mark Stone's got a very good shot, so he beats Rask glove side. And around two minutes later after that goal, the Bruins would concede again. 
So the Bruins would go down 2 0 because Vegas gets the puck deep in the Bruins zone. Marchessault threads a beautiful pass through Krug and Carlo. Backdoor to Riley Smith, former Bruin. He'd be a good fit on the second line right now. Gave up on him too early. Who puts it past Rass to make Vegas go up 2 0, 8 20 into the first period? And I was wondering, are we just going to get run out of the T Mobile arena tonight? But luckily, the Bruins would actually respond, and not just respond in the game, but in this period. Bergeron would force a turnover on Derek Anglin on the boards, which creates an opportunity for Marshawn to cross-crease to Pasta, who gets his first of the year. And uh, get used to me saying Pasta puts the puck in the net because uh, it's happened quite frequently. He might actually lead the league in goals. He's got to be up there. He's got like eight or nine right now. But uh, that was 11-21 in the period. Late, first, late in the first period, Brandon Peary goes to the box. First slash, very good power play, tons of chances. Marshawn over, what the heck did I write here? Over halfway hits a, I can't even read what I wrote there, but Marshawn hits a one-timer that flutters and it squeaks through Flurry at two, I don't even have, it's just late. Um, my notes are trash. I don't even know what I wrote here. But uh, anyway, Marshawn gets a one-timer on the power play, which flutters and beats Flurry. I, I remember the goal. I can picture it in my head. I don't remember what specific time, but late first period. So the Bruins respond in the first period to tie the game 2-2 and then go on to score two more goals in the second. And Vegas is looking up at the scoreboard and they're like four unanswered goals. How did those two goals happen though? 33 seconds into the second, Shea Theodore fails at dumping the puck out of the zone and Posternock off the turnover, spring 63, Brad Marchand who has an angle for a shot and he snipes. Brad Marchand in the zone tonight, two goals and puts the Bruins up 3-2 early in the second period. And you have to be thinking the wall, the wheels are falling off for Vegas now. Uh, Roll reversal here. Uh, two minutes later, the Bruins get possession in Vegas' zone. Two minutes later in the second period, so still early second. Tory Krug rips a one-timer through traffic and finds the net. 4-2, Carlo and Corrali assist. And I really thought Vegas was going to fall apart, but out of uh, the run of play, they change it around, they lock things down, and they would not allow another goal in this game for over half the game. Um, game had so many notes, I have to go to the back page. Uh, late third period, Marshawn, dumb cross-check against McNabb. Vegas power play, this is late third, as I said. Patriotti snipes from the top of the circle on the power play. 4-3 Bruins. Patriotti is a very talented player, as we know from seeing him play for Montreal all those years. Good shot. Beats the Bruins. Uh, goaltender. Um, it was Rask in this one. Uh, we hang on to win 4-3. I think this was our best performance of the season so far, to be honest. Even up to the games that have happened since this one. It's just a resilient comeback. To get slapped in the face early by Vegas and then put up four unanswered. And the only time we really struggle after the four goals we put up is a power play goal, which is going to happen in this league because you have so many talented offensive players on power play units across the league like Pacioretty and Mark Stone. And that's the only thing we let up. So only two even strength goals against through three games, which I mean, only one against Vegas, none against Arizona and one against the Stars. 3-0, and and I believe that was the first time the Bruins had started 3-0 and in over, I think since 2002 or three, I think it was said. Don't quote me on that. I just remember hearing it a few weeks ago when that was the case. We then move on to the Bruins' first and only regulation loss. I got to include that because these overtime losses, I just don't count as losses because it's not the same game. I mean, what sport has, like, goes to overtime and they go, okay, we're going to take players off the field so there's less of them. Hockey, that's, what, that's the sport. Uh, but I understand from uh, marketing and time... Uh, perspective that you know you can't have the guys playing all night all this time because uh, as we've seen in the playoffs you get three overtimes occasionally two overtimes and uh, that's just not good for the athletes when you play an 82 game schedule but anyway the Bruins with a uh, loss to the Avalanche here Halak versus Grubauer some depth changes as uh, always it seems like with Bruce Cassidy shuffling these lines looking for some depth scoring uh, this was a reverse Vegas, to be honest. We blew a 2-0 lead. I need to bring up the pitchers, man. I'm going to forget about that a lot, aren't I? But uh, let's just bring in these new pitchers. We got the Avalanche, 41-36. to High shots for both teams. Uh, and really, like, this game, you this is the toughest loss of the season. And uh, I say that even though we lost to Tampa and Toronto because this game was in our graphs. And a uh, few unfortunate situations happened that I'll get to later that uh, caused us to lose. So, 
758 in the first. Krejci with a zone entry. Puts it on nets. Brad Marshall collects the rebound. Wraps around. Cross crease feed the pasta for a goal. Another pasta knock goal. And it looked like a mental lapse from Nikita Zadorov. The big Z as they call him. They're trying to steal that nickname for us. Those freaking Colorado Avalanche people trying to steal that nickname from us. He is a big Z though. He is a big man. But uh, mental lapse. Uh, didn't really seem like he knew what he was doing there. And uh, Bruins go up one nothing early. 15-34 into the first. Zodano gets a puck at the point. Big slap to flex off Landeskog. Puck luck. And uh, it goes past Grubauer. Hits off Landeskog's stick. 2 nothing up. And uh, then in 18-28 into the first period. So a little over a minute and a half left. Too many men penalty on the Bruins. 19-04. Uh, Landeskog goes straight at Carlo. And rips a puck off the post. And uh, and Holock's back. It goes post Holock's back. Drops to McKinnon. And this is a gift for McKinnon. 2-1. Late, late period goals are a sign, man. I'm positive. When you get scored on late in a period, it just goes downhill. As uh, you can tell, I mean, it happened to us against the Lightning. I uh, just, you know, just when you get scored on in the last two minutes or so, it's like you're so close to getting out of there with a 2 nothing lead. And I bet if they do, if they did that, they would have probably won this game. And, you know, there was a lot of things that could have went right that could have led to us winning this game. But anyway, going into the second period, 9.43, Bruins attempt breakout. Marshawn with a bad, 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 bad turnover. Forced by Matt Calvert. Cross crease to pierre Edward Belmar to tie the game 2-2. And uh, just like the goal the Bruins scored against Vegas, uh, off a bad turnover. And, you know... That's how hockey's played sometimes. It's a game of mistakes. And the Avalanche capitalized off the mistake here. Uh, I think a little before this, yeah, there was a goal disallowed. It was early in this period. My notes are a little out of order. This is why I can't do eight games, man, because notes are just out of order. I need to do four or five games just to have it more ordered. Uh, it was a goal disallowed, a Coolman goal, because of goaltender interference. And then uh, in the third period, you had a DeBrusque goal. Uh, overturned by offsides uh both were very very close and i'm a little surprised that uh one of them didn't stand because of how close they both were but uh, i'm not going to mention those at all because those don't count they're illegal plays so i'm just going to move on uh anyway unlucky break after the bruins had a goal disallowed on the uh matt calvert to belmar goal really unlucky so uh third period Grubauer made some key saves, specifically a one-timer save by Brad on the Brad Marshawn. And then uh, 12.54 left in the third period. Burakovsky forces a turnover on Jake DeBrusque. The zone entry pulls up. Clifton goes for a slide because of the pull-up by Burakovsky. He didn't see it coming, and he uh, broke his ankles. Moves in towards top of the circle in a ridiculous snipe. He took this from his own D zone into the offensive zone dropped Clifton and then sniped with a ridiculous release to uh, beat Halak and uh, that's the best goal I've seen this year so far I will say that uh, in the Bruins games at least I, I do watch some other games but Bruins specific games that's the best goal for or against the Bruins uh, just a great singular effort by Burakovsky and uh, it puts Avs up 3-2 because uh, Landis Scott scored for them Belmar scored and now Burakovsky 3 unanswered uh, the announcer said he does it all himself, which is exactly true, minus the Don Squoy screen, which obviously helps in the fact the goalie didn't see the puck. Uh, and then uh, 1859 in the third, Landeskog empty netter. First goal, I mean, uh, first loss against for the Bruins. Sorry if I'm stumbling a little. It's a lot to talk about. Uh, two goals called back, which is pretty tough. Unlucky result, in my opinion. Uh, we outshot them. We scored the same amount of goals of, as them. It's just two of ours didn't count, LMAO. Uh, but, you know, 3-1, and one, that's a very good start to the season. Tough L, but, you know, the Bruins didn't look like a bad team. And in a loss, I guess that's all you can ask for is for them to not look incompetent. Home opener, game five. So we started with four road games. We get the fifth game at home, and we face the New Jersey Devils, which is a sad group of guys right now because they have had a pretty bad start to the season. Not really sure what their record is at the moment. It is 2-4-2, two, and two, so they're actually not last place in the division. Uh, probably because they played two more games than the Rangers, who are last place. But uh, there's really not much a lot to be said about this game. Uh, obviously, they introduced all the players, which is nice to see. They have the big ceremony. 
Uh, but 333 into the first period. Marshawn at the top of the zone. Top shelf snipe. Nah, it redirects off of Severson's chest and goes in. I thought it was a snipe off first glance, but it hits Damon Severson's chest, and you take them how you get them. Bruins go up 1 0. 11 22. Offensive zone face off for the fourth line. Uh, one to Char, shot into a crowd, somehow squeaks out in front from uh, Corrali and Wagner, but Nordstrom uh, buries it to make it 2 0. Second period, you jump to 18.59 into the second. Palmieri trips McAvoy, and 15 seconds later, a greasy power play goal by Bergeron puts us back. Uh, he puts it home at the back post for a rebound off of a Marshawn shot with DeBrus plugging away on Schneider. Uh, Tukaras gets a shutout. I believe the Bruins have, uh, yeah, I believe they've had two shutouts this year. This game, which I didn't even put up, the, I'm really bad at this. I'm, I'm going to have to make separate slides to click to, but uh, I'll put the devil stats up now. But uh, second shutout in five games. I believe they only have two shutouts on the seat. Yeah, they only have two. But uh, as you can see, the Devils 0 for 4 on the power play. They didn't really get anything going. Didn't look competent. They just didn't look like they were on the same level as the Bruins, which the records show that. And uh, Tuka gets a shutout. I believe Halak had the other one. Yeah, Halak had the other one. Bruins improved to 4 to 1. Not a lot else to say about this game, to be honest. That's really all it is. Devils kind of look miserable and look like they're in for a long season, but they do have talent, so they could make a late season push. I don't see them pushing for anything anytime soon, though. And we move on to one of the more fun games. That is the Lightning. Did I not take a picture of this? Is this it? Yeah, here we go. The Ducks versus the Bruins. As you can see, the Bruins did not have their best game, but talent prevailed here. Uh, and uh, fun fact, me and two of my buddies actually went to this game. I was on fall break, so I was back in Massachusetts. Matinee, I didn't have to go back to school until Tuesday because they gave us an extra day for whatever reason off. So I took advantage, went to the garden, and had a great time and saw the boy David Postnock score. Not one, not two, not three, but four. I don't know where the camera is. Four goals. I've never seen a hat trick in person uh, before, so this I've been to a lot of games too. It's rare to see a hat trick, and uh, I saw a hat trick and then some. Sadly, my two friends who both had hats didn't throw them. Um, despicable. But uh, so first period, four ten into the first slash by Del Zotto on Charlie Coyle. Lindholm fails to clear the puck on the penalty kill. Crew gets it at the point down uh, down Bergeron who. I, oh, okay, okay, okay. Lindholm, God, I need to start over. 418 into the period, 18, 8 seconds into the power play. Lindholm fails clearing it. Uh, Krug gets it at the point. Bergeron, who has the back to the net, gets the puck from Krug. Pass out to Postnarok, who tees up a one-timer, coming down with a little bit of speed, and Gibson had no chance. And that is numero uno for David Postnarok. Uh, it felt like each team could add another goal after the first period, but uh, the first period ends one nothing with the Bruins, and the Bruins looked like they were in control of the game, but the second period did not go as much of their uh, way with the flow of play, but they came out of it tied 1-1. 11-38 in the second, really bad period. Uh, first line makes things happen, though, and this was a first line night where the team didn't play well, but the first line's talent prevailed. Hampus Lindholm again with a bad turnover in his own zone. By a four checking Marshawn, two on one for Marshawn and Postnock, and uh, the one timer is beautiful from David Postnock. He is in form early on, and hopefully he keeps it up. I want to see him get 50. He would have got it last year if he stayed healthy. I'm convinced. But um, beautiful one timer, Hampus Lindholm just having a rough go today, and the first line's picking him apart. Postnock with his second goal of the day, basically a pass into the night. He didn't even raise it off the ice because the pass was just that nice by Marshawn. Uh, 1752 into the second period, Raquel would snipe, low glove, and uh, all you can really do is tip the cap here to Raquel. He takes it in the zone, doesn't really have a lot, but he uses McAvoy as a screen, gets a good release on his shot, and uh, beats Halak low. And uh, you go to the third period, up 2-1, to one, not looking your best, but the first line keeps scoring, so you don't question it. 220 into the second, Ozone faceoff. Steal from Anaheim wins it hard off Manson. And this, uh, unfortunately for them, is just really bad puck luck. Goes right to Postnock, who's just in the zone and just slaps it right off the ice in like a millisecond. This goal was scored like a second after the puck was dropped. And he beats Gibson 5 hole, who just has can't do anything about it. Gibson, again, just left out to dry by unfortunate situations and his teammates' incompetence in Hampus Lindholm. And the Bruins go up 3-1, Pasta with the third of the day. Uh, 337 Comtois holds Coyle. This will be the second goal uh, that the Bruins score in this game off of a penalty 
a power play that was given to them by a penalty drawn 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 by Charlie Coyle. And uh, on the power play, 434, so about a minute into the power play, Bruins get possession of the zone. Krug to Marshawn to Pasta, tic tac tap in, beautiful pass by Marshawn, and Pasta would get his fourth of the game. And uh, I was hoping he got a fifth and sixth, sadly he did not. 1608, Halak basically mishandles the puck, leads to a Henrique to uh, Nick Ritchie one-timer, which was basically on an empty net because of the mishandle by Halak, but Halak played a very good game outside of that turnover, so you can't really hate on him in this one when you're up 4-1 and he does a little mistake like that very late in the game. Inconsequential, and the Bruins win over the Ducks 4-2 to go to 5-1, and one. and um, the talent of the first line can carry the Bruins against inferior teams. Obviously, against some better teams like the one coming up, if you don't get depth scoring, you're probably not going to win. But uh, that was probably Halak and Pasta's uh, best games of the season. I, that's not even a question. Uh, probably not for Halak, actually. His shutout was pretty good. Pasta's best game of the season wasn't the team's best game. Heinen, though, had a good game. He had a lot of scoring chances, I noticed, from the stands and in the highlights. Power play did well, finally. And um, Getzlaff, trash. Punching Wagner like that? trash man he must have not liked him when he was in Anaheim when they played together but uh one thing you got to note in this game which I haven't got to yet which some of you are probably like why have you brought it up Krejci left the game with an injury and he would be out against Tampa for the next game and obviously these next two games mean a little bit more because when you're playing a division rival they just mean a little bit more and Toronto and Tampa are at the top of the heap right now with Montreal slowly behind them but they're not as good so we don't care about those games quite as much at the moment or at least we shouldn't i know some of you historically just hate montreal more but i'm a little younger so i hate toronto and tampa more just because eh, maybe not i don't hate tampa as much i hate toronto more though let's be honest though they've just been annoying uh we beat them every time but their fans are annoying and uh they probably find me annoying too uh, first period, Sergachev holds Brett Ritchie, Bruins to power play, and the Bruins would be heavily reliant on the power play. As you can see, all three of their goals come on the power play, and this is concerning, yet, you know, when the Bruins power play is on, they should win games. You should get an even strength goal against Tampa. I'm sorry. But uh, Sergachev holds Brett Ritchie, Bruins to power play, Bergeron faceoff win, Marshawn to Krug at the point, shot block, Bergeron gets the pass to Pasta, who's going to the net, shot, beat Vasilevsky, one nothing, and... Um, Posternock, man, gets another one on the season. Uh, the Bruins are up 1-0. That was at the 9.34 mark of the first period. But uh, they looked like they were going to go to the second with a 1-0 lead. But Braden Point would score with 0.8 seconds left. Uh, point slips between 73 and 33, which is really tough that neither one of them came into the central part and disrupted Point or realized how he was streaking. And uh, he was hit up with a pass, and he would finish on a... Uh, on Tuka Rask on this one, and a uh, really tough way to end the period. Uh, the second period, Yanni Gord intercepts Bergeron, oh, interferes with Bergeron, Bruins to power play, Bruins set up 63-88, to one-timer, no, pass to Bergeron, beautiful. And uh, what I mean by those notes, I just read my notes, is uh, Poshnok faked the one-timer, and everyone and their mom thought he was shooting it here, but uh, he goes cross back into the middle to Bergeron, he gets a tap and bees, you just think Pasta shooting with the way he's been on. But uh, he catches everyone off guard with a pass to Bergeron. Bruins go up 2-1, to one, but they would squander this lead. These three minutes later, Matthew Joseph scores. Tampa Bay gets a transition because of bas a bad miscommunication between DeBrusque and Brett Ritchie. Uh, drop pass by DeBrusque. Ritchie doesn't acknowledge it. And by acknowledgement, I mean he just skates by it, which WTF. But, uh, you know, he just goes by it. Uh, leads to a transition breakout. Matthew Joseph gets in the zone, passes to Kalorn. Kalorn shoots, squeaks through Ras, but doesn't go in. Goes behind him, and Matthew Joseph puts it through. Uh, turnover, bad. Defense to try to block shot by McAvoy, bad. But I really think this one's on Ras. This is not a very good shot that squeaks through him, and it leads to an easy rebound to Matthew Joseph. Blame should go to everyone, but a little more on Ras there. Not his best game. I think Rash should have uh, saved this one and the next Tampa goal. But anyway, 2-2 two -two game, 447 into the third. Three on three, Tampa breakout. Stamkos to Shattenkirk, uses Char as a screen. Char's got to block this or Tuka's got to save this. Squeezes through Rask, and when the puck hits you like that on a shot, you probably should save it, but it squeaks through, and uh, Tampa goes up 3-2. And uh, one minute later, Sorelli trips Posternock. Bruins to the power play. Bruins set up. 
gets super tight. And when I say super tight, I'm talking all of the Bruins players were below the circles and had all of the Tampa penalty killers literally in front of their net. And then that would come to benefit the Bruins because Posnarok would shoot it off of Shattenkirk and uh, it would go in 3-3. Overtime, no goals. Bruins losing a shootout because no one can score except for Steven Stamkos. And have fun with your extra point, Tampa. You'll still be behind us in the standings. Uh, and, man, shootouts, man. I'd rather have continuous three-on-three -three overtime than shootouts, to be honest. Because shootouts are just crap, in my opinion. But uh, they're fun to watch, but they're stupid for standings. Um, that's just my opinion. But I can't hate this loss because it's in a shootout and it's against a very talented team in Tampa Bay. You not gonna cry over that. Not gonna cry over that. Uh, kind of like how I'm not gonna cry over this loss and I'm not even gonna really feel bad about it because it's on the road in Toronto and they get an overtime point uh, out of this one because uh, really good back and forth game. Those are the standings. What am I doing? That's the one down. It's it here. No, that's the Abs. Where did I not get the Leafs one? Is it right here? There we go. Uh, as you can see, Frederick Anderson stole this game. 46 shots. Uh, a lot of puck luck for the Leafs, too, in this one. Uh, this is why I can't be mad at these results, because there's really just a lot of unfortunate situations happening to the Bruins and their loss. Like, uh, I think if you had to pin a game that they deserved to lose, it was probably Tampa because they didn't score a regulation goal, uh, five on five goal, I mean. But overall, uh, Maple Leafs and Avs loss, I'm not really too upset with because. I felt like we were arguably the better team in both games, but uh, obviously it's hockey, so it doesn't always go your way. I'm sure in a seven-game series, we'd beat the Avs and Maple Leafs. Wink nod. But um, first period, five minutes in, pucks on net goal for Morgan Riley here. Shot from the point, deflects off Carlo's chest and through the five hole, and that's a terrible way to start. Uh, four minutes left in the period. Lee's four check. Corrali eventually gets puck in own zone with time. Timoshov, though, forces a turnover. Really, what the hell is Corrali doing here? This is one of those goals you just look at and you go, what what is happening here? Corrali just needs to get out of the zone, needs to find a pass, needs to give it to someone else, but he gives it to Timoshov. Timoshov takes it, uses Clifton as a screen. Not really much Clifton can really do here. And Timoshov with a beautiful snipe. And uh, credit to Timoshov. He did what he had to do, but you would like to see Corrali make a better play instead of just giving it straight to Timoshov. 2 nothing Leafs. And, uh, yeah, it was a really crap start to the game. But, luckily, 30 seconds left in, the, left in the game. Wagner pins Justin Hall to the boards and leaves own zone. Coyle gets the puck, goes around back to the back of the net. He goes around, gets the puck behind the net. Then he crosses in front to Jake DeBrusque, who really needed this goal. And thank God he put it past Frederick Anderson. I thought he snake been. Jake DeBrusque gets on the board, gets his first, and hopefully there's many more to come in this talented young kid. 2-1, and that is a very timely goal because it makes the deficit only one compared to two with uh, two whole periods to go. So hopefully they could get something going. Uh, no goals in the second. Late second, though, Marincin hooks DeBrusque, and we would score in the third period. With two seconds left on the power play, second unit with Posternock on it, uh, scores. So McAvoy shot, misses wide, Posta gets the puck, a little no-look tap pass towards the net to Richie, who then finds Danton Heining cross crease, who puts it top shelf on a diving Frederick Anderson with a ton of real estate to shoot at. And the Bruins tie the game 2-2. Two -two. However, right after the Leafs got zone entry, Mikhaev, or Mik Mik however you pronounce his name, he's new, I'll get it, I'll get it by the... By the end of the season, by the inevitable playoff series first round, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get all their names. I'll get Timoshov's name right, whatever it's for Dimitrov, Dim I don't even know, but I'll get their names when we inevitably play them in the first round. Mikhaya passed a muzzing coming down from the point he had a lot of space to come in at, shoots it, rebound off of Coil the quarter foot who just chops at it and whacks it fluttering past Yaroslav Halak to put the Leafs up 3-2. Bruins with five minutes left. First line out there. Zone entry. Three Bruins, four Leafs. Um, I don't know how they left Posternock open with numbers down low. It looked like Marner just got caught watching the puck because it was definitely his assignment. He was the closest. It should have been where he was. He was watching the puck. Posternock got the angle. Marshawn notices that the sniper's in the area. And he passes it to the sniper who just goes shelf on Anderson to tie the game. Game goes to overtime. Matthews finds Marner in the slot. Not great defending on three on three. Shot goes off Riley and in. More puck luck for the Leafs. More puck luck for Morgan Riley. 
I don't watch all the Leafs games, but I'm pretty sure not all of his points are like that. But he got pretty lucky tonight. And the Bruins drop to 5-1-2. and They have only failed to capture four points this year in eight games. So they have got 12 of 16 points. They're only behind Buffalo in the division now. Which, uh, as you can see, where is my intro? You got the standings here. You see Buffalo with a phenomenal 7-1-1 start. They're rolling. That Victor Olsen kid's got a shot. And uh, we're ahead of the Maple Leafs. We're ahead of Montreal. And Tampa has been underperforming very Tampa standards. Last year, they would have had like all of the points that were available except for like maybe one. Florida with their new look. Not really uh, good so far, but uh, Joe Quinville will eventually get his... Uh, palms all over the team and you know mold them the way they want it's just going to take some time with a new coach new goalie and but a lot of the same forwards uh detroit and ottawa their cellar dwellers they should not creep up into this conversation of uh divisional spots at all but uh so far i'm pretty happy with how the bruins look and this is a really long video and this is why i'm gonna cut out uh four games i'm probably gonna do four packs from now on so uh, let me look at the, if you're here now, you're definitely going to watch the rest of this, I'd assume. Uh, so I don't think I'm wasting your time. Let me just look at the schedule. Uh, let me go to the Bruins, actually. I'm trying to pull it up. I'm pretty sure they got, they have Toronto tonight. That's actually starting in 19 minutes. I'm really pressing this here. And then you got the Blues, a Stanley Cup rematch. You then get the New Look Rangers, who have actually cooled off a little. And then you got San Jose. So those are going to be the next four games. So... I'd expect my next video to be around Halloween, probably Halloween uh, after, probably, yeah, it's going to be a four-pack. It's going to be after that game against the Sharks. You should expect my next video. Um, please share your thoughts with the Bruins so far. I, I would go more into detail with stats but uh, and all that, but I've already talked for way too long. It's 46 minutes, man. This is a podcast. This is this isn't a video. This is a podcast at this point with images. But um, next video, I'll talk about four games and go over more stats and more like Corsi chances for chances against more numbers because I just wanted to talk about the games, what I've seen, talk about the Bruins and all that. And uh, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I'm glad to be back talking. Sorry, I almost burped. I'm glad to be back talking hockey with you guys. I hope you enjoy my coverage. I hope you guys are pumped for the rest of the season like I am. And I hope you've liked what you've seen from the Bruins, as have I, minus a little bit lack of depth scoring. But eight games is not a big sample size in an 82-game season. Obviously, the next time you see you, there'll be 12, so that's a little bit more. I'd say around 20 games, you know what you have in your team, and you know what they really need and what they really need to fix. So by that point, I should have a lot more to say about this team and have a lot stronger opinions. Uh, that's going to be it for me, though. Expect the next video around Halloween after the next four games. Uh, hit like. That really helps. Hit subscribe to follow my coverage of the Bruins for the rest of the season. Sorry I stumbled so much in this video. It was just... Oh, sh I can't, I'm not going to swear. I'm going to keep it PG. There was a crap ton to cover, though. Eight games is a lot, and I hope I recapped it as well as I could. Sorry if I missed anything. It was a lot, and I know I probably missed something that someone will comment if there's enough people watching this. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video. Peace.